this computer. All right. We are off and running. All right, no cussing tonight. This is going to be on recording. <laughs> um, we uh, rarely think of runaways as heroes. Jonah was certainly one, though. And tonight we're going to be talking about someone who was a runaway uh, who received a second chance and um, historically became quite a hero. And we'll talk about that um, at the end of our class uh, tonight. I want to ask you to find uh, Philemon in your Bibles. Uh, Philemon is 335 words long, uh, carries quite a, a punch and is radically different from any of other any of Paul's other writings for a variety of reasons we'll talk about tonight. Uh, what I want to do, what the approach I want to take for this text is I want to um, just read uh, Philemon, and after we read it, um, I'll have just uh, maybe a minute of, of, uh, of comments to make, but um, I will ask you after we read, basically, to tell me in your, your mind who Philemon is, tell me who Onesimus is, and then we will work our way through the uh, text. So um, here we are in uh, Philemon. And if you have your text in uh, front of you, um, we'll see if, um, oh, Tanya, cool. Let's see if she's able to jump on here. Tanya, can you hear me? All right. Okay, we'll see if she makes it. All right, we'll, we'll go ahead and read from, uh, from the book of Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace and peace to you from the God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank God as I remember you in my prayers, because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel, but I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you would do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one more thing, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, sends you greetings, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. All right. Letter of Philemon, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, 335 words long, uh, glorious on many levels, gloriously messy, one of my uh, college professors uh, used to like to say. 
Um, one commentator uh, named Robert Jewett says it's one of the most subtle letters in world history, an expression of Paul's ambassadorial style as an ambassador, easy for me to say. Uh, one commentator same, same, named Lightfoot says an expression of simple dignity, refined courtesy, large sympathy, and warm personal affection. So, so both interesting takes. Uh, this book is fraught with some interesting challenges uh, for us to contextualize and to wrestle with. Uh, reading Philemon's in a lot of ways is like coming to, into the middle of a movie and having to catch up on what the characters are, what has already happened in the plot, and then you have to leave before the movie's over. So, so it's kind of a weird dynamic in a lot of ways. Uh, we don't know for sure, we have some ideas, but we don't know for sure where Paul was in prison. We don't really know for sure how Onesimus came under Paul's influence, other than most importantly, other than God's providence. Uh, we don't know why Onesimus ran away. Um, there is uh, one or two um, commentators I read that argue that maybe he didn't run away. Perhaps he was sent away on an errand and he just chose not to come back. That's kind of like running away to me, but you know, that's a different story. Uh, we don't know if he left because he was mistreated. Um, and the weird thing about this is Paul never says exactly, specifically, what he wants Philemon to do other than treat Philemon as a brother. But beyond that, he just says, I'll know you do the right thing. I'll know you do the right thing. Um, and of course, we've got this whole other in the layer of this that Paul seems to be treating running away from a slave owner as a bigger problem than owning mm -hmm. in the first place. And uh, we'll deal with that a little bit before we are, are done tonight. All right, so I've talked enough. Uh, now it's your turn. Uh, tell me who is Onis, uh, Philemon first. Tell me who Philemon is. Left you speechless already. All right. He was a member of the church at Colossae. Okay. He was and, a member of the church. Go ahead. I'm sorry to cut you off. That's okay. And uh, 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 apparently a, a loved brother to, to Paul. He had and, baptized him. And that might have been, I guess he baptized him possibly. Okay. All right. So he's he's from... Colossae, uh, Colossians chapter 4 actually talks about sending him. Um, and most likely the letter to Philemon could have been sent along with Paul's letter to Colossae, uh, in fact. Um, he's a resident of Colossae. Um, he has, a, he has a, a very close relationship with Paul, apparently. All right, David, what were you going to say? Well, uh, in addition to that, he apparently is essentially a local leader in the church. I mean, he has um, a congregation meeting at his house. Okay, so he's he's um, a leader in the church. Uh, there's a, house, a church meeting in his house. All right, uh, let's go Richard, then Tom McTie. I'm going to assume that he must have uh, some degree of success if he's got uh, at least a slave or slaves possibly working for him. And if they're meeting in his home, and if uh, Paul's inviting himself to come and stay there, it must be uh, reasonably nice enough or big enough to that this that uh, Philemon enjoyed some moderation of success. Or Absolutely, stand, standing might be the better word. Yeah, I think so, Richard. I think so, and and evidence is that is indeed the case. Uh, Tom McTie, Richard said it very well. Okay, all right, right along the same lines then. Okay. Um, so we don't know for sure, but we, we believe that Aphia was his wife, Archippus most likely his son. Um, others believe Archippus' wife might have been the leader in the church that met at Philemon's home. But um, all of these things are true about Philemon. Uh, the one thing that uh, you didn't mention, but we're probably going to mention next, is uh, Philemon was a slave owner. But this is um, something we need to think through in a first century uh, context. Um, there were 12 million slaves in the Roman Empire. There were 60 million residents of the Roman Empire. So 
The 12 million slaves make up about 20, made up about 20% of the population. And the entire Roman economy was highly dependent on this group of labor, both skilled and unskilled. Um, owning slaves in Rome was like you owning, and, and this is gonna sound awful, but it's true. Um, a Roman person being comfortable enough to own slaves in the first century was as natural to them as you owning a car or a television. Um, now these slaves were, they performed all kinds of tasks. Some were cooks, some were shopkeepers, some were teachers, but there were some slaves that were even uh, doctors. This had nothing to do with race. They were all ones who had been conquered by Rome. So they had varying levels of expertise. Um, a slave could be sold for any amount between 500 denarii and 50,000 uh, denarii. Uh, masters could choose to free slaves if they wanted. Slaves could buy their freedom if they could come up with the money. The problem was if a master freed a slave or the slave ran away and the slave didn't have a way of making a living, that slave would end up uh, homeless. Uh, some of these slaves uh, were treated very harshly. However, most were treated like either family members or as wise investments. Um, like, again, like you would care for your property. Uh, they would care for their slaves. Sometimes they did it altruistically because they had good hearts and they wanted to care for the people that were in their home. Sometimes they, they took care of them just because they were, it was like taking a care of a car uh, uh, to them. So with all of that said about um, just these simple things about Philemon, now tell me a little bit about Onesimus. What do you see in the text about him? Yeah, David, go ahead. Well, he's been a problem child, apparently. Yes. <laughs> yes, uh, from useless to useful, and we're going to talk about that juxtaposition here in just a minute. Okay. What else? Yeah, Richard, go ahead. Well, at some point in his conversations with Paul, he had to have a softening of his heart. And as he moves further into the chapter, it, it becomes repentant enough that he is willing to go back. Okay. And then that's a, and that's a huge, huge deal, that a, that a change has happened in Onesimus's life, a significant one. Uh, Tom Green, were you going to uh, say something? Well, uh, he, uh, he he was a runaway slave. Uh, <clears throat> made his way to Rome, <clears throat> heard Paul, and I think Paul uh, was the one that changed his mind to go back. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. So if he is a slave, yeah. Go ahead, David. I also wanted to point out that um, from Paul's perspective, um, a Jew, a Jew of Jews, right? They have centuries of both being enslaved and owning slaves. Interesting, interesting juxtaposition. And there were rules about it. And, you know, after so many years, they can, you know, be freed and blah, blah, blah. But the concept was not only Roman, it was also a deep seated Jewish concept. It was okay. the whole. It was the whole Mediterranean basin, really. It was a world con. Uh, that part of the world concept. Yep. Yeah. Tom Green. I, I would say that probably, perhaps nowhere in the New Testament is the distinction between law and grace so beautifully portrayed here, uh, because, like David said, both Roman law and, and Mosaic law. Uh, the Old Testament gave Philemon the right to punish a, a runaway slave uh, that he considered his property. Uh, but the covenant of grace through the Lord um, changed that. And I think there's a, it's an 
uh, Philemon had to have some heartburn over that. Okay. All right. Um, we're going to come back to what you just said and, and add some layers to it because that, that's very, very important. Um, now let's, let's uh, take one step back and then we'll take a few steps forward. Um, we mentioned um, what rights you would have because he ran away. Um, the owner um, could register the name of a runaway slave with a description, they would put that slave basically on a, what we would call a most wanted list. Mm -hmm. Any citizen could capture that slave and then negotiate a price with the owner uh, to return him uh, back. Um, apparently, uh, Philemon uh, took some things on his way out the door. We, we assume that because when, when Paul says, if he's wronged you, uh, we assume, yeah, he probably wronged him um, on the way out the door. Um, now, as as you guys have mentioned, God's hand is in the middle of this because uh, by the providence of God, Onesimus meets Paul, and Onesimus is converted. And it is a significant change, uh, so much so that Onesimus is going to go back to Philemon. Um, Barclay um, writes this, and, and then we'll talk about the, the inherent risk of, of this move. Um, he says, Christianity is not trying to help people escape from their past and run from it, but it is enabling them to face their past and rise above it. Um, Onesimus wow. ran away, so he must go back, face up to the consequences of what he did, and rise above them. Um, so that's an interesting uh, interesting take, but it is a take that is fraught uh, with risk on both sides. Um, what is the risk on Onesimus's side by going back? Easy question first. Yeah, David. Well, Philemon uh, has every right to do anything he wants to him, including kill him. Um, not likely, but but he can be pretty severely punished so there's definitely the that risk if he goes back um it this is something that's potentially punishable by up to death legally um not that we would say philemon would do such a thing again no no now let, let's uh let's take the other side of that what are some of the possible negative consequences for philemon by <clears throat> taking anesimus back what kind of risk is Philemon taking? Yeah, Tom McDy. Uh, he's risking uh, the authority in his household. Um, if he takes him back with a, as a brother and as no consequences, if he has other slaves or the other people in his house, as far as workers, may feel that he's being weak. And very well may try to take advantage of that on any of a number of fronts. Correct. Um, yeah, go ahead, David, and then Richard. Uh, I totally agree with Tom, but in addition to that, let's assume that he really, you know, stole something, broke something, did something on the way out. How is Fulman to not know, know that he won't do the same thing, you know, again? Okay. Grab something, steal it, run away again. Sure. Sure. Good point. Richard. Well, in addition to the risking the wrath of his household, he risked the wrath of his neighbors in the way he's let him come back. What is that going to, how's that going to affect their slaves in relation to their relationship? Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Good point. So this is, so this risk is going beyond his house. Uh, very good point. Um, now, if you're a slave in Philemon's house and Onesimus comes back, and he is received as a, a brother because he has made Jesus Christ Lord of his life. If you were a slave, wouldn't you give some serious thought to at least pretending to make Jesus Lord of your life? Not necessarily to really make him Lord, but to try to receive some preferential treatment. 
So you, you've got you've got that possibility um, as well. So Anisimus is taking, he's got some risk too, or, or Philemon rather, but Philemon's also got risk if he does not uh, take him back because his, his testimony um, as a follower of Jesus Christ is on the line in this whole thing too. So uh, refusing to accept Anisimus does great harm to the testimony and the forward movement of the gospel. So there, there's stuff on, there's issues on both sides. All right, yeah, go ahead, David. Yeah, I know, I don't know you're really clear, but I don't support any of you. Oh, goodness. <laughs> any of that at all. But um, if you put yourself in the time, they haven't sorted this all out yet, right? Right. The Christian world is pretty new, and they don't know all the rules. And how does this, you know, how does this all work? So this is this is new to them. Okay. Yeah. I've also put something else out there. I don't think this is the case here, but you could literally, if you were down far enough on your luck, you could literally do the indentured servant thing and say, "Hey, look, I'll work for you for seven years, you know, and I'll do anything you want, and basically I'll be your slave." And and they would call it the same thing. All right. It wouldn't necessarily really be the same thing, but it would be called the same thing. So right, 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 exactly. All right. Now, um, if you've got Philemon in front of you, that um, we've done the the big picture view. Now let's let's um, let's go a, a little more micro. Um, you will notice uh, right off the bat, the first thing Paul says is Paul a prisoner of Jesus Christ and Timothy our brother what does Paul not call himself in his greeting yeah David a leader an apostle nothing that elevates him I'm a, I'm a slave of, of Christ absolutely and that that is significantly different from most of Paul's uh, letters um, Right off the bat, he's setting the tone that he does not want to make the appeal he's going to make to Philemon out of authority. So, in fact, um, maybe even a little play of "I'm a, I'm in jail." So, so it's a totally different uh, um, approach. Paul is basically emptying himself of his rights um, because he could say Paul and an authoritative apostle. He's going to empty himself of that. That's important because in this letter, he's going to ask Philemon to kind of empty himself of some of his rights um, as well. Um, I think it's interesting that Paul addresses this letter not just to Philemon. He addresses this letter to the house church. Um, why do you think he did? This is a very personal issue. <laughs> So why do you think um, Paul would address this to the entire house church? And what do you think might be some implications of that? Yeah, go ahead. Well, kind of my point earlier, they have to wrestle with this as a, as a congregation, as a, as a people. And, and that is um, without having a, like you, without having a paradigm and figuring out as they go, um, the whole church is going to have to deal with the consequences of this. So the whole church is brought into uh, this. Um, Paul speak. Also, yeah, I'm sorry, is that Jeannie? Yeah, I was just yeah go ahead. It also um, puts some emphasis on Philemon's accountability. If this was just a privately requested favor, um, the same result, whatever it is, might not have happened. Okay. All right. So that, that's a very important point that there's a, there's a level, there's a layer of accountability being brought into this uh, with, with those that are meeting uh, in, in the house church. Good, good point. Uh, so Paul uh, says in, in verse four, he's doing his Thanksgiving and his prayer. Um, he says, I hear about your love for all his holy people. I hear about your faith. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement. You have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. What's Paul doing here? 
Yeah, go ahead. Well, in part, he's buttering him up, but in, <laughs> but in part, he's, he's also um, encouraging him to think along the lines of what has been good and what has been positive in their Christian walk. And that is very, very important. Um, Paul is coming along beside and, and talking about this great joy, uh, this, what they are sharing together, uh, how they've been blessed uh, together. Um, commending Philemon for the way that he has shared in his faith with other believers, how that's warmed their hearts uh, together. Paul uses a lot of we in verses one through seven, because I'm right there beside you. We're, we're doing through doing all of this uh, together. Um, the one thing you will not find. Yeah, go ahead, Tom. Sorry, Tom Green. I, I'm, <clears throat> I, I just have a question. Isn't Paul being consistent with what he wrote in Colossians um, 4 and 1, where it said, Masters, treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven? Isn't he, isn't he being consistent here? Absolutely, he's being consistent. In fact, um, I think we need to have, I think we need to dive deep on that and have a whole class on Colossians starting at the end of August. To, uh, to go into that in little detail. How does that sound? Good. <laughs> um, actually, I was being, actually, we are gonna start a book, a study of Colossians when we finish uh, The Unlikely Heroes, but I appreciate you bringing that out of uh, Paul's consistency in his character, and he's doing what he said in the Colossians uh, 4.1. And then later in that chapter, in, in verses eight and nine, he talks about sending Onesimus, actually. Uh, right mm -hmm. in the midst of that context. So that's a very good point. Um, now, the one thing about Onesimus. Um, uh, Tom McKay wanted to say something. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed you, Tom. Go ahead, brother. Uh, not a problem. I, I was just saying, and adding to that, by Paul saying we, by him mentioning the fact that they were refreshing the Lord's people and causing and, and joy, by constantly saying the we and those things, He's treating Philemon, even though he's a Gentile, even though, you know, he has a Greek name, even though he's far away from Paul and, and the rest of the church, as far as, you know, Colossae is concerned, he's treating him like a brother and he's talking him to him like a brother. And he wants him to know that what I'm saying in this letter is to a brother. And I would like us both to agree on what we would like to do on this. Mm -hmm. And it's not as much, you know, giving him the, the sugar before the medicine as much as I think it is treating him like an equal and a brother and letting him know that they are partners in Christ, that no one is above anybody else. I think that's very, very important because he's, he's inviting Philemon to come along beside him. Um, as a as a partner in ministry and what they're doing, they're doing together, and that's going to be very important for the uh, intellectual appeal. He'll kind of pivot toward in verse eight. Um, you will notice that the name Onesimus has not appeared until you get uh, further down. Mm -hmm. um, we don't even hear his name in these first seven or eight verses because uh, Paul is making very uh, significant effort to mm -hmm. lean into their personal relationship right. and trying to, uh, to, to uh, add layers to that. Um, we, we should not be surprised by that, of course, because we know that um, more people than not are one to Christ through a trusted relationship, not by being beaten on the head, not by being ordered, not by being argued with, uh, people are one to Christ through through the context of of, of trusted relationship. Um, so that that's an important thing for us to uh, consider. Um, the shift the shift kind of happens beginning in verse eight uh, when Paul goes to more of an intellectual appeal. Um, so as you look through verses eight through sixteen, and I'll give you a minute to 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 look at that as you have it in front of you. 
I want you to uh, to share with me um, some of the things that Paul bases his appeal on. Um, what what are some of the things that Paul bases his appeal on in verses eight through sixteen? Uh, Della. Um, one of the most obvious is love. Love is love is the biggest. Love is the biggest. Okay, good. Also, Paul is old and sick and in prison. All right. Um, Paul being very honest about his own situation and drawing, almost drawing and not playing necessarily sympathy, but being very honest about, about his own, own status. Um, good. All right. Tom Green. Uh, I think what he's pointing out here is that we must recognize that God holds us accountable for the treatment of others, whether they're Christians or not. And um, I, I think that's what Paul is trying to say here. Okay, good. Uh, you, you know, we're accountable to God for that. Uh, Absolutely. And he's going to hold us accountable for it. Absolutely. Uh, let's go Tom McTie, and then we'll continue to make our way around. I, I believe Paul is, is actually urging forgiveness as well and in a large way i believe he is you know look talking about freedom freedom not just for a uh Nephibus, but you know freedom for for everyone in christ and i believe that you know philemon as 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 he reads this he's got to see that you know paul's heart is telling him you know you have every right to do these things, but don't do it. You know, free the man, treat him as a brother in your household, and let him no longer be a slave so he can be useful. Okay, good, good. All right, let's go David Frost and then Jack. Okay, yeah, so um, beginning of the letter, he, he and, and Philemon are, are brothers. He, he makes that point. But then to Della's point, he talks about love. And then he talks about these two guys being brothers. Your slave is really your brother here, right? So he really, he brings it full circle here. And, and he basically wraps up the, the love of Christ into the brotherhood of Christ. Okay. I'm so glad, so glad that you're pointing that out because we've got Paul saying, Philemon, you and I are brothers. Then Paul's going to say, now Onesimus and I are brothers. So now... Philemon, you and Onesimus are also brothers. Um, Jack. Yeah, I just uh, have a question in my own mind in verse eight, where he uh, makes, where Paul makes the statement, therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, is, um, is Paul sort of alluding to his uh, authority as an apostle? To, if if I so desired, I guess I could kind of say you have to do it this way. Am I reading that right or no? Um, it could be. Um, the word boldly here can also be uh, freely. Um, uh, so apparently uh, Paul is feeling a level of restraint here uh, for the sake of, of this relationship. And um, there Times when um, it is uh, it is easier to get cooperation through relational strength than it is through top down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, but I think could, but could he could he actually, as an apostle, really sort of kind of order that? Um, he could, but as your minister, I could say under the authority of God given to me as a minister, I tell you this, 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 and this, and you can say, well, you're not telling me anything. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's go. We're going to go around here. So let's go Tom Green, Tom McKay, and then Richard. I, I think Jack's question is, is very relevant, uh, but I think it's... Um, Paul, based on his request, not on his authority, but based on Philemon's Christian commitment. Okay. And just like you just said, Mike, you know, you could say based on my authority as, as our preacher, 
But unless I'm committed as a Christian, that doesn't mean a thing to me. Sure. Sure. Good point. But, but I think Jack's question is very relevant. Very important. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, who does say next? Tom. Tom McTie. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, when I when I read verse eight and and, and along with it, I, I think about these old war movies that you see on television, where the where the officer is talking to the sergeant that wants to fight on, and he tells him, you know, don't make me order you to go back and not keep fighting. It, it reminds me of, of something like that that he doesn't want to make his, you know, request an order, even though he can. He wants to make it so that the person will do what he's supposed to do and realize what he wants to do, pretty much like we teach our children. You know, it's one thing to tell somebody to do something, but it's another thing to teach them and get them to do it on their own. Big difference. I, I agree. Big difference. Yeah. Richard. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to dovetail on, on Tom here. Uh, I think that... Um, uh, the way I read it is that um, Paul has enough faith in, in confidence in his relationship with Christ and with Philemon that he could say, I want you to do this, and, you, and he would do it in deference to Paul and in respect. But I think the entire 810 verses there is Paul's power of persuasion to really get uh, Philemon to look inside at himself and come to the conclusion without it being forced. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's kind of the way I see this entire uh, diatribe, much the way, uh, and, and one of the gentlemen, it might have been Jack said it, um, or, or Tom, that, you know, an adult dealing with a 16 or 17 year old is going to have a much different conversation than he might have had with that child when he was eight or nine to get mm -hmm. him to see uh, what the right thing is on his own. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good point. Good point. All right. So Paul appeals to Philemon. Um, he leans into the personal relationship. He speaks of the conversion of Onesimus, uh, that Onesimus and Paul now enjoy what you and I enjoy. We talked about that a uh, circle. Um, Onesimus has definitely proven himself uh, to Paul. So apparently this conversion has changed Onesimus in a very profound way. In fact, um, there's a little word play I'll point out to you really, really quick in verse 11, uh, where you see useless and useful. Um, I've, I discovered that uh, both of these words are pronounced exactly the same way uh, in Greek. Um, akrestos and akrestos, they just have a one letter difference uh, but a crestos means useless, and another a crestos means Christless. So basically, if he's Christless, he's useful, useless. But now he's become in crestos, he's become useful because he's in Christ. So it's a very interesting wordplay that, that Paul uh, does there in uh, verse um, 11. Um, he says when he's sending him, he's sending his very heart. And then, of course, in verse 15, Perhaps the reason he was separated was that you might have him back forever. In other words, God's hand's been in this thing the whole time, uh, which, is, which is so important to understand that, that you lost him for a little while as a slave. He's coming back to you forever as a brother. So God's hand has been uh, in the midst of this. All right, so in uh, 17 through 25, Philemon has legal rights to exact revenge. Paul tells him instead to forgive. Um, that might be one of many takeaways that we could take home with us tonight, that there are times when we have, um, at least um, in our own minds, or maybe even in, in world's mind, we would have every right to be angry. We'd have every right to be upset. We'd, try to, we'd have every right to try to get even. Uh, Paul says, no, 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 no. Uh, you uh, forgive. Treat Onesimus like you would treat me. Put his charge on my account. Um, however, Paul was able to pay for that. Um, that's a very interesting phrase when Paul comes back and says, by the way, you owe me your life anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a very interesting um, approach there. 
Um, as Paul takes on Onesimus', Onesimus debt to Philemon, though, in one way it changes the relationship because that means Onesimus really doesn't owe Philemon a debt if Paul pays off that debt. Um, so that, that's another change um, in their uh, relationship. All right. Um, I got about five minutes left, and I want to I want to honor your time commitment tonight. So here's what I want to do. Um, I'm going to share with you a couple of things historically about Anisimus. It'll take me about a minute, but I want you to be thinking about why do you think this book is included for us in the Bible? Because it's so different from everything else in the New Testament. That's the question I'm going to want you to answer in just a minute. Why do you think this is included in the Bible for us? Um, very quickly, historically, according to ancient tradition, after Philemon and Onesimus reconciled, uh, Philemon sent Onesimus back to Paul. Around AD 110, an early Christian leader named Ignatius, the bishop in Antioch, wrote a letter to the church in Ephesus. In that letter, he addressed a bishop in Ephesus uh, by name several times. That bishop's name was Onesimus. Um, Ignatius seems to be quite familiar uh, with the letter to Philemon. Um, Philemon would have been written 50 years prior, which makes that, it, it just seems to tie all of that uh, together into a very interesting package uh, to show that there's strong evidence that Onesimus that's described here in Philemon eventually went on uh, later in life uh, to be a uh, bishop in uh, Antioch. Um, church tradition says Onesimus was a servant to Paul and the other apostles until his death, and then he preached in places like Spain and Colossae before moving to Ephesus and then uh, to uh, Antioch. Um, he may or may not have been martyred during the reign of Trajan. Uh, so we've got the book of Philemon. Why do you think we have it? It's been preserved for us. We've got it 2,000 years later. Uh, David Frost first, and then Richard. Um, okay, so here's a man who started essentially worthless. He was property. He wasn't a man in their culture. I'm not saying that I would be that, but sure. okay. Um, and he became a full brother in Christ. There is no barrier to being a brother or sister in Christ. It just simply does not matter, okay? And beyond that, if someone becomes our brother or sister in Christ, it doesn't matter what our prior relationship was. They're our brother and sister in Christ. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Richard. I'm going to, I totally agree with what David said, because Jenny had said basically that same thing in here a few, few minutes ago when you first raised the question. But I also see this book as showing as um, being another example for all of us. It's an example of ongoing discipling and, um, and relationship mm -hmm. and what doing the right thing means. And, but to me, it's quite an example of, of, of discipling. It's a great example of discipling the way Paul comes along beside and the way he deals with Philemon, and that's a good observation. So we don't have, yeah, Tom Green, go ahead, brother. Well, from a modern society perspective, I, I think what this tells us is that we're not to treat our employees, our helpers, our family members, and other Christians as stepping stones. Mm -hmm. We're to treat them as equals. And um, like Della said earlier, with love, and recognize that, um, like I said earlier, that God holds us accountable for how we treat them. Absolutely, absolutely. Very good observation. Tom McTighe. I was thinking as as I read this again, um, you know, when we when we read books like like Philemon, you know, under five hundred words, you know, we always get something new out of it. It seems like whenever we go back to to a to a book or something, we always seem to get more out of it. And oftentimes we read and we study, but we don't learn and enjoy while we're reading. Mm -hmm. And I think this book, as small as it is, is a gateway to the understanding of, you know, read your Bible, you know, and enjoy it and learn from it and look at the things that are offered to you, even in this small book, offers us so many different things. 
I appreciate that observation, and I, I appreciate the, the read, and I really appreciate the enjoy, and, and, and to, to soak it in and be blessed by it. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm going to uh, add one layer to, to the, everything that you said, and uh, we'll be done for tonight. Um, obviously, there's not, this is not heavy theology in this book. Um, it's very personal. Um, there's a great message of compassion. Um, there's a great message of reconciliation, uh, not only between Philemon and Onesimus, but in a very real way, um, we, we have been Onesimus ourselves. Um, at some point in our lives, um, there was a time when, when we belonged to God, but we ran away and we fell into sin. We met Christ who willingly paid the price for our sin. He said, leave the charge of that sin on my account. Jesus is telling God, even right now, when you look at them, see me. So in a very real way, this is, um, this is our message too. Absolutely. So, um, uh, been blessed by, by sharing this with you uh, tonight, and I hope you've been blessed uh, by our time together. Um, next week, we are going to look at the life of John Mark. Uh, if you want um, to write down a few passages, I'll go ahead and give this to you now because it's going to be uh, two or three different places to look, most of them in Acts. But um, next week, we'll be talking about uh, the life of John Mark. Uh, some text to read, uh, Acts chapter 12, pretty much the whole chapter, 1 through 25, Acts chapter 12, 1 through 25, uh, then Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 13, Acts chapter 15, Verses 36 through 40. And then two very short readings. Uh, Colossians chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Last one, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. I'll go back there and review those again for you. Um, Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 25. Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. Acts chapter 15, verses 36 through 40. Colossians chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. And uh, we'll, we'll see some interesting things uh, in John Mark's journey uh, next week. Uh, thank you all for uh, being here tonight. And uh, Tom McTie, would you find, lead us in a final prayer, please, sir? Of course. Oh. Heavenly Father, as we approach your throne once again, we are so mindful that everything that we have comes from you. Heavenly Father, we are in awe of your almighty power and all the things that you have done for us. But we are also in awe of your forgiveness and for your grace and for the blessing of your son that was our sacrifice in this world, that he gave his life that we might live. Heavenly Father, we pray at this time that we would see the world and those amongst us and all the human beings that we come in contact with through your eyes, that we would not see color, we would not see creed, we would not see what they look like, we would see a soul to be saved, a brother or sister to be cherished, and love. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we are ever thankful for the blessings that we have in this life. Regardless of situation, regardless of wealth, let us be truly thankful for the blessings that you have given us. And we pray that you would continue to bless us physically, financially, but most of all spiritually. Strengthen our faith, strengthen our love for you and for our fellow man, and bless us as we go into this world as your shining light to be a beacon to those that do not yet know you. We pray, Heavenly Father, for those that have lifted up tonight, 
if they be physically sick and need healing, if they are mourning for a lost loved one, we pray that you would give them peace. And we pray that you would strengthen all of us and you would bless us and let us shine as your children. We pray these things in your precious son's name. Amen. 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 Been blessed to be with all of you tonight. Love y'all. Love you, everybody. Love you too. Night. Take care. Night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.